Hi, my name is Piers Rudyard and I am the CEO of Radix. And this video is going to be a little bit about why a security audit for a smart contract could cost a million dollars. Um, and this really gets to the heart of what I think is really important around the concept of security for computer programming. And what is often one of the un told unseen costs about developing decentralized finance today um, and that's a uh, fundamentally because the way that people build smart contracts um, and the code that they use is not really suit for, suited for purpose what i mean by that is Ethereum's language for programming is this language called Solidity, which is based on JavaScript. And the reason that they took that, or one of the reasons, is JavaScript is the most commonly used language in the world. And wouldn't it be great if we made a really easy to program, uh, syntax, syntax wise, um, uh, language so that lots of people could come and build smart contracts? What wasn't really envisaged at the time that that was sort of created as a concept was quite how difficult it is to secure languages that follow syntax, anything like JavaScript for a start, languages that are built in the way that Solidity are, and fundamentally any, any program that is associated with controlling value uh, programmatically in a way that anyone can come and attack, um, which is fundamentally what's happening on, on top of a public ledger. On top of a public ledger, I create a smart contract, I create a decentralized application, I put it running, and then anyone can come along with any kind of input. And, you know, in the traditional finance space and in the traditional computing space, if I build some really bad code on my server, First of all, that code is not open source, so people can't come and look at all of the ways in which it can break and, and, and be able to attack it. And secondly, um, it may be high behind a permission stack. It may actually require people to register as a user and identify themselves as, you know, uh, owning um, Acme Corp. And these are the directors and to get the API key so that I can call the server in the first place. I have to do all of these validation steps that create this web of trust and, and, and web of traceability behind the people who are actually using these, the, 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 these computer systems. So suddenly this idea of having to make sure that the program is perfect and can never go wrong sort of move, moves away from the center of programmers' minds, but you have to bring it right back to center when you're thinking about smart contracts because they are open source, uh, which means that anyone can look at how the code is written uh, and what's happening in it. Now, you can, ob uh, you can do some things to, um, to, to hide the, 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 wh what is actually written because actually, you know, Ethereum is executing in the VM, and so it's not in the Solidity syntax that the all of the uh, nodes on the ledger are, are going through because that it would be way too what's called verbose, which is way too big and clunky. But um, most projects actually do make their code open source, and you can backwards compile um, if if you so desire and you have enough enough time and 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 uh, an inclination. And actually, some of these attacks that you see on some of the more popular um, uh, public ledgers uh, sometimes are what's called handcrafted bytecode. People have gone in and worked out how everything works, and and then worked out a way of messing around with it by feeding a string of nonsense to the computer that makes the computer basically choke. Um, this really famously happened to Ethereum um, when someone worked out a way of, of uh, basically bringing the network to a standstill in uh, around the time of DevCon 2. I think it actually was exactly when Dov DevCon 2 was going on or just before. Um, and so fundamentally, you have to build with this idea that everything's going to be attacked. Um, and that's a lot more difficult than it sounds because the way that you build in a language like Solidity uh, or any uh, object-orientated language is you're, is you're kind of just saying, 
you, you've got a lot of logic statements that go, if this happens, then do that. Um, and you can kind of just throw any inputs into that. Often these inputs are un, what's called unbounded. And so well, I expect the user to put a number between one and a hundred into this input, right? But have you made sure that the user can't put in negative numbers? And have you made sure that the user can't put in more than a hundred? And have you made sure this and that? And so you get all of this error handling code or, or, or ways in which you try and stop people doing stupid things. But more importantly, ways in which you try and stop the user from forcing functions inside a program to do something you don't want them to. Um, great examples of this include things like the DAO hack, which happened, uh, you know, in 2016, I think it was, when uh, there was like $130 million worth of Ethereum um, in, in, this, in, this, in this smart contract called the DAO that was designed to invest into the ecosystem. It was a great idea. In principle, was rushed out in practice. There wasn't such thing as security audits really back then. And someone didn't notice a very simple thing called a recursion error in one of the calculations that was a, around splitting off the DAO that meant that people were suddenly able to drain the DAO of millions and millions and millions of dollars. And actually, that was the reason that Ethereum Classic was created, which is kind of mind-blowing. This difference between people were like, well, you know, this all this money was stolen and it should be returned to the people that it was stolen from, or all this money is stolen and code is law, so oh dear. And that's what happened with Ethereum Classic and why Ethereum Classic exists today and Ethereum decided to fork and reverse and reverse the hack, which was hugely controversial at the time. However, a great example, like that code was written in association with some of the early um, creators of Ethereum, like Vitalik Buterin reviewed it himself personally, and still this thing was missed. And so this set of tools came about um, where people were start talking about formal verification. And you hear about this a lot. And a formal verification takes lots and lots of uh, forms, but it's just trying to express all of these states that a system can be in. Now, sometimes a system can be in an infinite number of states. So actually completely formal, so formally verifying that it's never going to be wrong in any state is really difficult. And if you compound on what I was talking about, you know, is the number between one and a hundred and what happens if it's a different number? If you combine, combine that with other like crazy stuff that can happen within uh, computer programming, like stack overflows where the where the integer size became too large and so it reset back to one um, because it just basically counted around in a circle until it got back to the start again a bit like your your uh mile mile meter in your car getting to the end of the ability to count digits and suddenly it comes back around again to one again like and that kind of counting, you know, plus one, plus one, plus one, which is a really common thing to do in programming. Like, has this happened? No, plus one, and then do this. Has this happened? No, plus one, and then do this. As a really common way of progressing a program, all of these things can, are all variables that can be twisted on, on, a, on, a, on a smart contract. So it's not just, is the user going to make a mistake? It's the, can an attacker put in some information that will make the smart contract make it a, a mistake that the attacker will benefit from? Is there a way in which something has been badly implemented that can be taken advantage of? And suddenly you start to see the quite enormous task that is associated with building a decentralized finance application. Because not only do you want to build a decentralized finance application, which is fundamentally secure and that you you can't have money stolen from, you also have to make sure that not only can that happen because a user makes a mistake, but that can happen because a, an attacker who's sufficiently well um, who, who understands how the code works sufficiently well and is able to read this code in an attacker's mindset can come along and make it do things that you never meant it to do. So this is why a security audit for really complicated code that does lots of things can cost up to a million dollars, which for, you know, a, a coding cost of, you know, $100,000 of uh, man hours in solidity can can be quite a staggeringly large amount more than just the cost of building it in the first place. And this is this is one of these hidden costs that sort of exists behind all of DeFi. And 
There's lots of horror stories where, you know, people have created unaudited code and put money into it. Yeah, you know, Yam.finance was a was a great example of this where they were sort of it was an experiment, uh, had $350 million flow into it and then $350 million flow out of it almost immediately just because there was this bug in the code and it was unaudited. Um that that create this sort of like problem for the the DeFi developers had to face, which is, oh, I really want to get to market quickly, but I also don't want to lose people's money, and now I have to make these horrible decisions. So what what Radix did is we took a fundamentally different approach to how you build um, applications, decentralized finance applications, on top of Radix instead of going down the route of the um, object object orientated. Um, uh, programming uh, and having um, uh, uh, declarative programming we went down functional programming uh, which is a branch of programming that's not new it's it's sort of been around since sort of since the 1980s or earlier Um, but it has some really really good uh, properties that make it easier to define systems in a way that means that you can ha- are less likely to end up in a situation where an attacker can cleverly work out how to put some inputs into a program that makes it go into a state that it was never supposed to in the first place. And on top of that, the execution environment for these these programs that exist on top of Radix is something called conditional finite state machines. And we call these like programs that do specific jobs uh, and can be called on Ledger um, components. So instead of a program on Radix being a, a monolithic thing where you have your Solidity code and it defines everything about what all of that, all of what your decentralized finance application has to do. Instead, you build your decentralized finance application on Radix out of these little bits of Legos, these components, that each one of these components is a conditional finite state machine that uses a functional programming paradigm to be able to create very secure single use or, or, or small subset use functions. So let's say I've got a component that can do a continuous function market maker function. And I have another component that understands what it is to be a token. And I have another component that understands what it is to be a pool. Uh, and another component that understands what it means to own a share of a pool. And I can take these components not only can I build new components as a, as, a, as a developer on top of Radix in an environment that is fundamentally secure, i.e. both functional programming and uh, conditional finite state machines as your execution environment rather than, rather than a Turing complete VM, you can now compose these together to make these wonderfully easy to build decentralized finance applications that are also fundamentally more secure. Now, I'm not going to say that you don't still have to do some verification to make sure that, that, that you can't end up having problems with your application, but suddenly the attack surface area, the number of ways in which something can go wrong, is drastically reduced But at the same time, you don't have to build everything from scratch. Each of these components is an expanding on Ledger library that gets bigger and bigger and bigger as more developers provide more of these components, build them and put them on top of the Ledger, which you have to do to be able to use them. You then have more and more tools that you can draw in and go, right, this function does this thing that I want, this function does this thing that I want, this function does this thing that I want, I can glue them together and I can create my application. And suddenly you have a way of building and deploying in a much faster manner, but at the same time creating much more secure environments because the fundamental execution environment and the fundamental programming paradigm that you build on top of Radix is designed with security in mind. And just as, an, just as a final example of that, conditional finite state machines, again, 
are not new. We didn't make up conditional finite state machines. If you look at high frequency, high availability, high criticality systems, conditional finite state machines are everywhere. If you look at how nuclear power station control systems are built, if you look at how fly-by-wire systems for aeroplanes are built, if you look at the way that traffic light systems are built, if you look at all of these high criticality systems and even transaction systems where you want true atomicity at the database level, conditional finite state machines are excellent ways of enforcing uh, transactions that can that, that can happen um, in a way that is guaranteed to be much more secure. All of this is very well established, good design practice from elsewhere in the world where we have critical systems that we care about. And all Radix has done is gone, right, let's build around paradigms that are proven to be more secure so that we can deliver a public ledger that fundamentally allows people to build financial applications more securely and more quickly so that developers can get to market with the exciting uh, applications they want to in a way that is more cost effective, is more secure and doesn't end up costing a million dollars to audit at the end of the day. I hope that was interesting to you. And if you have any comments or suggestions, please do put them in the comments below. If you want me to talk about anything else or would like me to do a video about an, another subject, please do suggest that to me. Tweet me on Twitter. My Twitter is at Piers Rudyard. Tweet Radix on Twitter at Radix DLT. Come join us on Telegram um, at Radix DLT Official. Uh, or come and read more about us on our website, www radixdlt.com. Thank you very much for your attention and I hope that you have a wonderful day.